Hello and welcome back to another episode of Project Supercar. Now if you're new to my channel, I'm building my own supercar using an old Audi estate. Now in this episode we're going to cover the gear change. Now I used the gearbox from my front wheel drive Audi and I've put it in the back. So how do I change gear now I'm sitting in front of the gearbox? Now before we cover the gear change on this car, I think we'll have a recap from the last episode because I found some more pictures. In the last episode we covered the flat under tray of my chassis. Now I've managed to find some more photos without any panelling whatsoever. So here's an image of the chassis painted but upside down. There's no panelling fitted at all and I haven't drilled out any holes for the nut rivets or normal rivets. Here's a slightly closer image looking at how flat the underside of the chassis is. This is the engine bay area before I drilled out for the nut rivets. Is the uh, left side of the chassis. This is the right side of the chassis. Now these bars are to support the seats. They're obviously upside down in this image. Now I've always wanted the seats in this car to be bolted to the chassis so it's super strong, so there's no vibration, there's no cracking in the gel coat. So this is why I put some um, steel bars in the chassis to bolt the seats to. And you might notice the captive nuts. That's a, I think that's a requirement in some countries. I'm pretty sure it is in the UK. Your seats have to be held in with captive nuts. And here's another image of a set of bars for the other side. This is the front of the chassis, again upside down before any panelling was pot riveted and glued. Again, this is the centre of the chassis with no panelling whatsoever. Now, the tube on this chassis is 40 by 80. Now, the reason why I did a chassis tube which was so deep, 80, will become apparent when we cover the gear change cables and the handbrake cables and that sort of thing. Because I wanted to put all the cables inside the chassis away from the weather. And there we go, right back at the beginning with the painted chassis upside down. So now we'll get on with the gear change. Now, if you've been following along from the very beginning, then you'll know that I'm using an Audi 2.8 normally aspirated V6 mounted to a five speed front wheel drive gearbox. This is just for mock up because obviously I'm removing a 2.7 twin turbo V6 out of the new donor car. Now this front wheel drive gearbox used a linkage system in the original Audi A6 to change gears. Now I've not used a linkage system on this car, I've actually used cables. But before we go into that, uh, I think it's a good idea to understand that many supercar makers use uh, engines and gearboxes from other makes and one of those is Spiker and they've decided they wanted to use a rod system gear change. Check this uh, video out. Now once you open the Spiker's engine cover you'll discover that this isn't just an engine cover. Of course the engine is back here, the Audi V8 mid-mounted right behind the seats but this is also where the trunk is. The two share space under the engine cover. The trunk is leather lined once again, beautiful with green stitching and green carpeting to match the outside of the car. A couple of interesting things about the engine are the VW and Audi logos you'll find if you look closely. After all, it is an Audi V8. Although it doesn't have Audi printed across the top of the engine like it does when it's installed in an Audi, there's a VW logo here and an Audi logo here. And if you look on the door latch, you'll find an Audi logo too. 
And then we must talk about the shifter, which is probably this car's most famous design detail and by far the coolest shifter that has ever existed in any car. Ferrari gated shifter, pa! it's nothing compared to this. The shifter is mounted on this giant metal bar that runs from the front to the back of the car and the linkage that allows the shifter to change gear is exposed. Not only is that incredibly cool looking, but the thing just feels so mechanical and it sounds mechanical. When you change gear, you can hear it go into every gear. and it is just the coolest thing in the world. This is one of the all-time great shifter designs, and it's one of the things I always think about when I think about Spiker. Another interesting Spiker C8 shifter fact, number one, you can't shift into reverse when the car is off. I've never seen that before in any other stick shift car. You have to turn the car on. And once you do, you can't shift into reverse unless you know the trick. The top of the shifter is actually a button. Push that, and that allows you to get all the way over to reverse. Otherwise, climb in a spiker and try to steal it, and you don't know that, you'd probably never be able to back up. I love moving the shifter. It feels like I'm really doing something. It feels like I, I matter in this world. I, it sounds great, it feels great moving the shifter. I know that's a big thing everybody's always wondering about with this car, and the answer is it's just as good as you were hoping it would be. Now that was a nice gear change, and I would wager probably one of the best in the supercar world. Now I don't have the budget for that, so I have to do something a little bit more down to earth, but functional, which is this one here. Now this is a cable gear change. Now that's pretty common in the supercar sports car world, and one mark, which would be Lotus, also uses a cable gear change and they use it on a Toyota gearbox. Alright guys, I'm under the car right now, not really comfortable, but the blue part is the gearbox and the other components around here are the gear shifting mechanism. Next you can actually lift it up like this and force it out basically. It's a little bit of uh, squeezing but it works. As you can see, there you go. This is the left hand cable which is the cross gate selector cable uh, that you have to unclip and then there is another cable which is deeper down that you can't see really but it comes out here and that's your gear selector cable. The gear selector cable uh, is buried underneath this uh, wiring loom so we'll have to undo that a bit so we can get access to it and to do so you will need to cut the tie wraps which we'll do now and then don't forget to put them back afterwards because that is kind of important. So first uh, we'll remove the uh, locking mechanism which is sitting right here on the stick shift and that is just basically just pushing it down. There we go. You might just want to give it a short knock and it will actually come off. The next thing is to remove the retaining clip. Uh, the clip is off but we can't still get the cable out because a lot of stuff is in the way so we have to undo the metal part which is holding the handbrake there are two bolts one underneath the cable and one in the back so let me undo that first now the stick shift here's the stick shift and as i said before um it, its normal position is between gears two and three in the neutral position so, uh, if I push the stick shift to the, the right and I let go, it comes back. And it should come back to its normal position and I can move it to the right and it should come back. Now, uh, the stick shift is in the neutral position, meaning it's between uh, gears number three and gear number four. I'm moving the stick shift now in gear position number three. So we are in gear number three. Now we are neutral. What's the rot on the gearbox? Now it's in its neutral position. Now I'm going to pull the stick shift even more backwards and we are now selecting gear number four. If I move the stick shift to the left, then you can see that the mechanism is going down and it's pulling out the cross gate cable. If that has been pulled out, then basically the mechanism in the back of the car will turn the rod that goes into the gearbox upwards, so counterclockwise. Now you might have noticed on the Lotus Elise that the gear change cables and the handbrake cables are exposed. There is no flat undertray 
underneath the elise. So this means that the cables are open to the elements, uh, grit, weather, rain, sleet, that sort of thing. On my car, I decided to lift all the cables up into the chassis so they were protected. And this car has a flat under tray for aerodynamics and also weather protection. Now talking about gear changes, um, I think we'd better discuss manual versus automatic or flappy paddle gear change. On my daily driver, which is an Audi A6 3.2 Quattro, it has an automatic gearbox with some flappy paddles on the steering wheel. This is for manual gear change. We have a six speed automatic which can be shifted manually with these paddles. This one downshifts and this one upshifts. Now if you're going to be building your own DIY supercar or kit car then this sort of setup is really a bit too complicated for DIY purposes. You're going to have to transplant the ECU, you've got all the wiring, that sort of thing. And you might even have to reprogram it to make this gearbox work in your car. While we're on the subject of manual versus flappy paddle gear changes, I understand that the flappy paddle gear change can change gear a lot faster than if you try and do it manually. And that's because the computers are doing it for you. However, I do feel that you lose some of the experience. You've lost some of the fun. Now, if you've got a race car, fair enough, go flappy paddle. But if you are designing a supercar, then I really think it should be manual. Now I haven't finished the interior of this prototype yet, so that's why it looks the way it does. However, I do intend to put a gated shifter on this thing, if budget allows. Now is there anything more fun than a gated shifter? pretty cool. So like I say, when I do the interior or finish the interior on this car, I do want to put a gated shifter. Now I don't know if the slots are going to be quite like an H gate because this is a very short shift, but we'll see. Anyway, let's go back to my gear change. Now already you probably know that I've decided to use cables. Now, one of the reasons um, would be because I can reconfigure the engine in the back of this thing. I could put in a V6, a V8, a straight six, whatever. So I wanted the gear change to be adjustable, if you like, dependent on what engine and gearbox you choose to use. You can't really do that with a linkage system. But anyway, I think it's time I bring the camera in so you can take a look at the gear change and we'll take a look at the handbrake as well. I used a gear change lever from a Volkswagen Golf Mark III. I think it's the same as in the uh, Corrado. Now the reason I chose this is because it's very small and compact and most of it is made from metal. Now the gear lever bolts into the chassis with steel plates. Again, I did not want the gear lever to be bolted to anything made from fiberglass. This creates a very stiff gear lever with no flex. Now one of the things with the Volkswagen gear change is that the H pattern is different. On the Volkswagen Golf, the reverse is up here. See the picture. 
Now on the Audi, reverse is underneath the fifth gear. So to get around this problem, I had to cut away the reverse lockout from the Volkswagen Golf gear change. Here's some photos of the gear change before I fitted it to the car. So it was still in its box from the original car, which I believe was a Mark III Golf, uh, Corrado, that sort of thing. This is a picture up from underneath, another angle, here's another angle. So I had to remove the outer metal box. Here's a photo of the gear lever once it was removed from the, the steel box. Another angle, for, and there's another angle. Because the reverse lockout is in the wrong place, because this is from a Volkswagen Golf Mark III, I had to cut it off. So here's a picture before, and I just chopped it off and cleaned it up with the angle grinder. Once I cut away the reverse lockout, I could bolt it into the chassis. Once the gear change cables and the handbrake cables were in place, I could then route them in the engine bay. And here's a photo before the engine and gearbox was fitted in place. You can see that the handbrake cables and the gear change cables are sort of looped around the engine or where the engine will go. Here's another closer shot. And there's the cables, you can see the two cables for the gear change. And that's with the engine installed, with the gear change cables and handbrake cables all connected. Now the Golf Mark III lever does work quite well in this application. Although I would have preferred not to have to cut the reverse lockout from the gear lever. Now if any of you out there know of a small compact gear change which is preferably made from steel that has the reverse lockout in the same location as the Audi, uh, see this picture. So let me know in a comment below and I will research it and I may use it in the turbo build. So if you take a look at the gear change you'll see that the adjusters are inside the car. So they're quite easy to get to. And we'll take a look at the handbrake. This handbrake was from the original donor car and I just made some plates so that the handbrake could bolt into the chassis. Again, it bolts to steel, not fiberglass. I also used the original cables for the handbrake from the Audi A6. Oh. Tell you what, it's a bit difficult trying to film inside your own supercar. But anyway, let me get comfy. Oh dear. Right, handbrake. Both TVR Lotus and a whole host of other supercars do suffer from bad handbrakes. On the TVR, you will find that, especially on the Cerbera, the handbrake is at an angle. Um, this is because the uh, chassis runs down the centre of the car so you can't put the handbrake into the uh, centre tunnel. The Lotus suffers from a similar thing, you can't put the handbrake into the centre of the car because that's where the chassis is, so they put the handbrake just inside the driver's footwell. Now the problem is, is when it comes to MOT time, because these handbrakes sit for a long time, um, they don't work and I went to many an MOT with a TVR or a Lotus and it failed on a handbrake. On my car, first of all it's mounted to some steel and the adjustments are just back here. You can get to them, you don't need to jack the car up or anything like that. So when it comes to MOT time, if the handbrake is a little bit dull, then you can just tweak the nuts, <laughs> tweak the nuts on the back of your handbrake and that will get you through the MOT. <laughs> Here's another look at the handbrake from another angle. There's a switch on the bottom which obviously lights a light on the dash to say when the handbrake is on. That's what this green cable is for. It's just temporary.
Now that the gear lever was done and the cables were done, I could bolt the cables to the gearbox and I had to make custom brackets to hold the cables. I'll bring the camera in so you can take a closer look. So here's the gearbox with the gear change cables. As you can see, I made a bracket that mounts on to the mount. That's for the first cable. This uh, pushes and pulls front and back. Then there's an adjustable lever. And then there's another cable that pushes and pulls side to side. Now I was quite lucky on this gearbox because there was many mounting points to put all these plates. So I think it's time to see this gear change in action. This gear change does centre. It's sprung loaded. So it centres between third and fourth. Right, let's see this gear change in action. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and reverse. Right, so that's the gear change and handbrake on my DIY supercar. So I'm going to call this an episode, but before you go, um, if you haven't subscribed, then please click that button. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, you know, begging for subscriptions, but I've got to get over a thousand subs before I can put adverts on, and then the ad revenue is going to pay for me to finish this car. Now, I'm never ever going to get to PewDiePie figures or anything like that, but if I could get to say, I don't know, 50,000 subs or something, I should be able to generate just enough money to pay for all the fiberglassing and the steel and all the rest of the bits and pieces to get this car done and to also start on the turbo project. So anyway, if you could share, that'd be fantastic. If you know anyone with a giant YouTube channel that might give me a shout out, then you know, send my details over to them because it'll help me greatly. So anyway, that's enough of the begging. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.